Sufis and scholars. Question. What is the traditional Sufi objection to certain types of scholars, academic pedants as you have called them, based upon? Answer. These scholars may often be regarded as decorative and useful people. Their decorative and utilitarian aspects, however, should be clearly perceived in accordance with the principle that misunderstandings and distortions always occur when something is not defined which could be defined. They frequently desire attention and do all they can to get it. They do not seek to propagate their ideas so much as to require that people think that they are being scholars. I am constantly approached by eminent ones begging me to cite their works because citations mean importance. This activity is part of their desire to be seen, the self-display aspect. Again, some of them are jealous of special clothes and other appurtenances and rituals of all kinds which contribute towards their visibility. This characteristic is observed also in other human groups, in certain animals and birds, and is not in itself to be considered undesirable, even if only because we gain some pleasure from such displays. Like containers and permutation, accumulation and analysis agents of various kinds, they are able for the most part to hold, to preserve, even to pass on, but not to affect any real change in the materials with which they are concerned. A limited scholar who translates a book, for instance, may be giving its contents to someone who can absorb it, like a jug which contains water which will ultimately be drunk by others. Scholars of the lesser sort, however, being human and not animal or inanimate, sometimes tend to confuse their own desires with their real effect and possible functions. This is only because they may have an image of themselves which has been fostered without being investigated. As one of them said in this very room to some of us the other day, we just can't help it. Investigated it may not be, but it is observed. It is from Oxford, not the Sufis, that the joke comes, I am the master of Balliol College, and what I don't know can't be knowledge. Scholars cannot readily be studied by other scholars, who are, by virtue of their involvement, unlikely to be able to attain sufficient objectivity. Scholars, however, can be studied by Sufis. There are innumerable Sufis who have once been scholars, but there is no single Sufi known to us, perhaps to all history, who has subsequently become a scholar. Scholarship, therefore, may be regarded as a stage after which one may become a Sufi. Sufis never have followed scholars, though they have frequently equalled or excelled scholars in scholarship. Sufis can do this because they do not regard scholarship as an end, but as something useful, with the advantages and limitations corresponding to this function. Scholars, quite often, do not show signs of understanding that there is anything beyond scholarship, and therefore they are incapacitated, while they remain at this stage, from being able to have a higher objective. One must always have an aspiration higher than one's actual status in order to rise, even in an existing field. Such scholars, because they cannot move beyond their conception of scholarship, are driven to believe and to practice two things. One, they tend to make themselves believe that scholarship is of the highest nature among things and that scholars are a high, even special, product with some kind of property interest in truth or even a peculiar, perhaps unique, capacity to perceive it. The historical records of scholars in this respect, not to mention their individual experiences in being refuted by events, do not daunt them. And two, because they know inwardly that this posture of theirs is not true, those of them in the appropriate field are compelled to resort to the study of the work of their opponents, the Sufis. This is why scholars study the works of Sufis, but Sufis do not have to study the works of scholars, as one Sufi has cogently remarked. This tendency of the lower attempting to emulate the higher in spite of disabling limitations is evidenced in the behaviour of children, animals and other less developed or insecure individuals.
small boys pretend that they are adults, or else study what they imagine adults to be doing or saying. In the process, they quite naturally refrain from allowing themselves to register the adult's assertion that boys are still only boys. It is appropriate to stress here that, whereas a child may grow up, a man does not become an immature boy again. The scholar is too naive, in knowledge if not in contentiousness, for any Sufi to become one of the type we are describing. This stage the Sufi has already passed, if he needed to pass through it. When a child does not properly grow up, he will either be an unformed infantile man, or else he may die. The alternatives to progress are these two. What he imagines about himself, or what he manages to convince others about himself, do not affect the reality of the situation, though they may affect opinions as to the nature of the reality. Few people will disagree that there is a difference between the reality, the observed fact, and the supposed facts created by opinion and maintained by constant repetition. Any careful study of academic work will show how surprisingly often there is an unawareness, for instance, of the difference between polemic and informational communication. The Sufi's opposition to the scholar is not any opposition to scholarship. It is an opposition to regarding scholarship as something which it is not. If, for instance, one were to believe that bread and milk were the only true and valuable forms of food, it could mean that those who ate bread and milk might imagine that they had perceived and were operating at the apogee of nutrition. On the other hand, where there are other nutritions available, and when these are superior in some or many respects to those which are only supposed to be the solitary or best ones, a critical situation exists. The other objection which the Sufi traditionally makes is in the best interests of the scholar and his followers. It is widely known that an erroneous belief about oneself, particularly a fantasy that one is more important than one really is, can have an unpleasant and destructive effect upon an individual and on those who may rely upon him. To ignore such scholastic imaginings when in a position to comment upon them in a salutary manner is tantamount to allowing a person to damage himself and others, whether this damage arises through ignorance or malice. All social requirements of virtually all communities are unanimous in disallowing such a situation as this to pass unremarked, once it has been observed. If the means to deter people from this course of irresponsibility do not exist, or cannot be made use of, the role of the Sufi is to make available the information upon the basis of which others may be able to preserve themselves from the spread of the disability, or he might otherwise contribute towards redressing the imbalance. Protection and guidance is a function of the Sufi which takes precedence over any psychotherapeutic role. Yet it is easier for the Sufi to do his own job than it is for the afflicted to see his own situation because the victim can sustain and maintain his disease only by dogmatic activity and constant effort, propaganda and so on. He continues to fuel his own morbid condition because he has lost touch with the fact that the ailment is not really a part of himself at all. He therefore fears to lose it, since he now imagines that such a loss would mean a loss of himself or a part of what he takes to be himself. When the malaise is further linked with the desire to maintain social or other prestige, or to secure his bread and butter, the inadequate academic's position is tragic indeed. This is the condition described by ancient authors in their own language, when they tell of people who are infested by demons, or imagine that the demons are themselves. The opposition of Sufis and scholars like that of literalists and experientialists throughout the human community at all times, also has another face, one which is extremely interesting. Many, perhaps the majority, of the scholars who initially opposed our books on traditional psychology have become warm supporters of the concept of extra dimensions in learning, and I count many of them among my personal friends. In the past ten years, there have been several books and numerous monographs in which scholars have shown this change of heart. How does this come about? 
You should note that it is a matter of sociological evidence that the people who make the best friends are not those who are attracted to one another or to each other's ideas at first. On the contrary, it has been shown that the person who opposes you is likely to become a firmer friend than one who becomes your friend immediately. This may seem odd. It is certainly something which has been known for centuries to thinkers and experientialists, as I shall illustrate in a moment. On the perceptual, as distinct from the superficial, level, there is a communication which leads to harmony between nominally opposed people or attitudes. Were this not so, we would never get agreement following disagreement. But there is a stronger indication than that. The first illustration we can use, in order to offer this phenomenon in terms somewhat familiar to our present audience, is the saying of Jalaluddin Rumi to the effect that Things which are apparently opposed may in reality be working together. The reason why people do not ordinarily link this with the essential harmony of opposites is that they are using only the secondary self to assess the saying. Since they do not perceive this cooperation of opposites when it starts, they think that the opposition which they feel is the central factor. Secondly, if you cast your mind back to the New Testament, where Jesus is credited with saying that you should love your enemy, you will see that, from this point of view, you might as well harmonize with someone who opposes you, because this opposition is quite possibly the beginning of friendship, however it may appear on the surface. Love your enemy, therefore, is not to be regarded as a noble sentiment which makes you a better person especially but as an injunction which actually describes the deeper dimensions already existing in the relationship. Although hard to illustrate for those who have not experienced it, this parallelism between paradoxical homilies and essential fact is encountered in conditions of deeper understanding. Difficult to illustrate in personal terms, especially where individual disputes are concerned, it can be determined as existing in social contexts where the superficial self is not operating. Reconciliation, familiar to all of us in personal and community terms, is not so much the unification of opposites as the uncovering of the basic truth of the situation, masked by subjectivities. Sufis and scholars seem to oppose one another, but when they know one another's approaches and knowledge, this opposition disappears. The Sharpshooting Scholars Scholars themselves know a great deal about the besetting sin of their profession, that of over-specialization and blinkered dogmatism. Here is a story about the whole matter, told me by a scholar who himself admitted, unlike many others, that he knew that he was like one of the characters in the tale, but that there was nothing he believed that he could do about it. A number of academics, it appears, were enrolled in time of war into the infantry. After training, they all proved to be crack shots, capable of hitting the bullseye far more often than any other recruits. The time came for them to be sent into battle. As the enemy advanced, the order was given to fire. Nobody moved. For goodness sake, shouted the commanding officer, why don't you shoot? How can we, you fool, roared back one of the scholars when we haven't been trained to fire at people. An enterprise is measured by intention, not by appearance. Question. Can you comment on the statement, the success of an enterprise is measured by its intention, not its appearance? Answer. This statement is simpler than it looks, although it conceals some of the misunderstandings of the past. If someone is trying to dig a hole, the intention is to dig a hole. The success of the digging of the hole will be seen in whether the hole is actually dug. But in appearance, the man may be trying to find gold. If the observer thinks that the intention is to find gold, he will call the hole a failure. It is the same with teachings, institutions, theories, and so on. Many have been successful which appeared to be failures. Many failures have appeared to be successes because the intention behind them was not widely known. The danger in this situation is twofold. One, that self-appointed observers may completely misunderstand intentions. And two, 
that people, originally intending success in one range, may yield to the temptation to produce what can easily be called a success in some other range. The psychological mechanism exists whereby an individual can convince himself that he was really trying to do something other than he really was, so that he can harvest the success, and this is equally true of societies. Human progress is slowed down or halted when people aim for evident success, success measured by what people can easily describe as success, and lose impetus for success of intention. Example, false success. When Mullah Nasruddin, falling off his donkey and laughed at as a result by schoolboys, says, I meant to fall off anyway. Example, true success. When a team of doctors succeeded in inoculating a whole population against some endemic organism, whether or not the inhabitants think they are performing a magical ritual. Example, possible ingredient of success not essential to it. When some, or even all, of the inoculated people learn the background and purpose of the inoculation. Sufi organizations. Question. Can you say anything about Sufi organizations today and yesterday? Answer. Sufi organizations come into being from time to time. Among their purposes is the attraction, concentration, and transmission of certain perceptions. These organizations may or may not have what is ordinarily taken in conventional societies to be an outwardly spiritual or esoteric shape. This surface aspect is not necessarily important. A major objective of Sufi activity is sometimes expressed as aiding the human transformation process. This process can take place only if the organization, visible, identifiable or otherwise, is adequately attuned to the human being. This attunement itself may impose unlikely externals upon an organization. All such entities are temporary forms. When they have completed their effective lifespan, others take their place. The outward form, or husk, may, however, persist and contrive to perform social or other comparatively less significant functions. The inheritors of these forms seldom, if ever, realize that the entity is organically dead. This is why almost the last place in which to seek the continuation of a transmission such as the one being discussed is in apparently well-established traditionalistic bodies. These are more efficiently described as archaeological relics, easily recognizable by such by those who know their original extent, purpose and vitality. They develop a sort of quasi-adaptability, or else a rigidity, or a combination of these. The consequence of these characteristics is to cause them either to seek support from new formulations, or else to try to fight them. They always, however, lack real adaptability consistent with contemporary needs. This peculiarity arises when there is a preoccupation with preservation of archaic, anachronistic forms. Effective higher teaching, in contrast, always seeks to employ any form within which it can complete its mission. The Cause and the Effect Understanding Sufi organizations involves knowing what lies behind appearances. As Rumi says in his Fihi Ma Fihi, In it what is in it, If a sleeve moves, the hand has moved it. But if the hand moves, the sleeve does not need to move necessarily. So if you look at the caused and do not know the cause, you imagine that sleeve is something with a life of its own. Not even a king is immune from the rule that people jump to conclusions based on superficialities. This can happen with technology in the scientifically based West. The English King Edward VII saw a hissing vehicle lurching towards him. What the devil is that? he exclaimed, then gasped, Good God, it is the devil! But it was a motor car.